If you guys will indulge me, uh, I'd like to pray before I begin. Heavenly Father, there is no power in my words, but there is power in your truth, in your love, in your Son. I pray that everything that I say now brings him glory and lifts him up. I ask these things in his name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I have a confession to make. I am a huge nerd. Now, this may not come as a surprise to some of you, maybe even all of you, but it, it does seem to shock people when I first meet them. Um, I don't know, it, maybe they're thrown off by my appearance. I guess I don't look like your traditional stereotypical nerd, but uh, once I open my mouth, it doesn't take long for the truth to come out. It usually happens as it did the other day. I was having a conversation, and, and I was asked what my hobbies are. And I'm assuming based mostly on my size and how my face looks that most people think my hobbies are breaking big rocks into smaller rocks or being in a biker gang. But um, the reality is, is it's, it's more, much more nerdy. I love to, I love to read uh, I, anything I can get my hands on usually, but especially stuff about history and military history and the World War II, the Civil War. I could devour books or documentaries, anything like that for hours. But the thing that really gives me my nerd street cred is I love video games. Love them. And what, what, what kind of video games? I'm glad you asked. Um, now there's usually three types that I, I tend to gravitate towards. Uh, the first type is uh, first-person shooters. Uh, I tend to play those with my brother and my best friend. They're kind of spread out all over the continent. So I, I mostly play that to stay in contact with them because I'm terrible at them. But it's a good excuse to, to get together and talk and catch up and stay connected. Um, the second type is the, the sports games. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time with FIFA lately. Um, it's, a, it's a great game. It's, you know, it's really quick, 20-minute games. You can kind of drop in and drop out if you have a little bit of free time or if any one of the youngsters needs to be humbled by my mighty Liverpool. It's a good exercise. But those aren't my favorite either. My favorite games are the really big, like, epic adventure games where you go on a a long journey or a quest, usually to save the world or avert the apocalypse or something of that nature. And one of the reasons I really like those is because of the, the, the time and energy you get to invest in them, right? You get to search for little items that can help your character be more efficient as he battles all the forces of evil, and you get to customize your look, and, and it's, I don't know, there's something about the experience, it's, it's just that sense of adventure, that, that challenge that you get, but played out on a grand scale. I, I love that. And believe me, the games can get very challenging. I remember one game I played uh, in, in, in my younger, less mature days. Um, probably went through seven controllers over the course of that game. Um, it, 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 can, it can be really difficult. Games nowadays, though, are a little bit better at letting you know that uh, things are about to get real that the difficulty is about to come up. Usually, you'll get to an area, and if you start seeing a bunch of these chests, you know, maybe I need to be on the lookout for something. You start opening them, and usually an orb of some color will come out, red or blue or green. Um, you start seeing a lot of those in succession, it's usually a warning sign that things are about to, to get real, right? If there's a save point right after all those chests, it usually means that the game is about to ask me to do something incredibly superhuman or impossible. But it's all right because whatever the game asks of my character, it's going to give me the power to do. And I want to take a look at an instance in Scripture where this very scenario occurs. So if you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 10. Here we find Jesus gathered with his disciples, and at first glance, that's not an unusual set of circumstances, right? He would often take time in his ministry to pull the disciples aside for some kind of further instruction, some kind of deeper discussion, um, things of that nature. But as we get into the text, we're going to see that in this particular instance, 
something is different. Things are about to escalate. The disciples are about to learn that following Jesus means that life can get very real. So look with me, beginning in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 10, and it says, And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. And the names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now, I, I love that Scripture goes out of its way to give us that list, because I believe that God wants to be very clear who we're dealing with before we understand what we're dealing with. So look at this list again. I want you specifically to think about the occupation that these men held, right? Peter was a fisherman. Andrew was a fisherman. James was a fisherman. And John, if you had to guess, what would you say? Fish, yeah, good guess, fisherman. In fact, um, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Philip, while it's not recorded exactly what they did, most likely fishermen working with the first four. Um, a little bit less is known about Thaddeus and, and James, the other James. They sometimes call him James the Lesser, but I feel like that's demeaning, right? So James, son of Alphaeus. Um, they didn't really have a known profession, but what that meant most likely was whatever their father did, they did as well. They had learned a trade of some kind. It was very common in that era. So they could have been carpenters like Jesus. They could have done tile work, uh, masonry, farming, something. Uh, Matthew was a tax collector. Uh, Simon the Zealot was a terrorist. And uh, Judas, by day, was a mild-mannered CPA, and by night, a thief, embezzler, and just all-around scoundrel. These are the 12 people that Jesus calls over to him. And this motley crew had spent the last year and a half or so in close contact with the Lord, following him, observing him, experiencing ministry, but experiencing it as it came to them. And now Jesus was flipping the script and sending them out to seek out ministry opportunities. And as we continue on in Matthew chapter 10, I want you to look at what he is asking those 12 men to do. Starting in verse 5, it says, These 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Here's where it gets real. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse lepers. Cast out demons. You received without paying, so give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff. But the laborer does deserve his food. In whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. For truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than on that town. Now, taking a look at that list, I think that we can all agree that what Jesus is asking of these men far exceeds their qualification and expertise, right? These are, these are fishermen, these are tradesmen, dabbling in finance, both, well, mostly taking, not really giving, right? And one professional terrorist, okay? Jesus told those men to leave this place, enter a town, find somebody trustworthy that you can stay with, and... Tell people about my kingdom. In fact, don't just tell them, show them what I'm about. 
The things that you've seen me doing for the last year and a half, I'm giving you the authority to do that. I expect you to heal the sick. And I mean, like, if there is a disease, you're probably going to see it, and I'm expecting you to heal it. Even the lepers, if they come up to you, you cleanse them. Even if it gets so bad that these people are sick unto death, I'm telling you, you fishermen, you tax collectors, you can raise the dead. And I have to think that that's a little bit of a system shock for these guys. They have to be thinking, as I'm sure that we think as we look, what I thought as I looked at this list, that it seems that Jesus is asking them to go out and to do the impossible. But not if we remember this essential truth. Whatever Jesus is asking them to do, he is giving them the power to do. I want you to look again here at the, at the sequence of events involved in the sending out of these 12. It's not done casually. It's not a haphazard exercise. Christ is very intentional about what he does to prepare his followers in this moment. The first thing that he did is he set them apart. You notice it said in verse 1, right, that he called over to him the 12. And we kind of take it for granted when we hear the word disciples, we think of those 12 guys sort of automatically. But the reality is that Jesus had followers and hangers-on that had been with him throughout the entirety of his ministry that numbered conservatively in the hundreds, if not the thousands. We know that following his death, when they were gathered together and following his resurrection as they searched to replace Judas, they were, they were choosing from a pool of at least 120. They were gathered together in, in great numbers in that upper room. So, it, and, and all those people had to have been with Christ from the beginning. So it's not just that these 12 were the only ones that were recognizable and, and sort of tagging along with Jesus. There was a, a big group to choose from, but he specifically takes the time to call these 12 over and to set them apart for this special work that he's about to ask them to do. Second thing that Jesus does, and this is crucial to recognize this, but the second thing that Jesus does is he gives them the authority to do these things on his behalf. He intentionally provides them with the power to do the works that they had seen him do. Right? He's not asking them to do a task that they might be capable of. He is giving them the authority to do things that he knows that he is capable of. So he doesn't set them up for failure. He equips them for success. So he sets them apart for the special work. He gives them the authority, the, the, the ability to carry out seemingly impossible tasks that he's asking them to do. And then, only then, after he has done this, does he send them out. And as a result, this ragtag collection of people leave their master's presence and they go out two by two, often brother with brother, friend with friend. I kind of wonder if he sent Matthew and Simon the zealot together just because he has a sense of humor, right? But he sends these guys out and these collection of fishermen and tradesmen and CPAs goes out and they cast out demons in the name of Jesus. They heal the sick at the very sound of their master's name. They touch the untouchable and cleanse lepers on the authority of the Son of Man. And I have to believe, at least in one instance, although it's not specifically recorded here in Scripture, but it is, it is sort of tacitly pointed to when Christ charges them to do it. I have to believe that at least one of those little groups raised the dead. 
I, got, I, and I, I, I imagine them running back and telling Jesus and just trying to spit the words out, right? Like, could you, could you imagine if you raised somebody from the dead? How would you even explain that to somebody? And they're giddy, and they're trying to tell. And he's like, I know, I know, I know. I told you guys to do it. I, I, I'm God. I, I'm aware. But, but I have to think that they, they, they got, these, these are fishermen. And the dead respond to their words because they speak them in the name of the Most High. I want you to take a moment and think about that. Like really, really contemplate what I'm saying and let it sink in. It's important that we acknowledge and understand those sequence of events because that same approach that Jesus went through with his disciples almost 2,000 years ago is exactly the same approach that he's taking with you and me today. And make no mistake, Jesus is calling us, his children, to set out. And he is asking us to do what an unbelieving world says is seemingly impossible. But remember this truth. Whatever he asks us to do, he will give the power to do. I don't think you guys just heard me. Whatever he asks us to do, he will give us the power to do. Guys, this is exciting news because that means that when we are called to serve, and make no mistake, each and every person in this room that can hear my voice is called to serve in their own way. God has a plan for your life. He has passions that he's given you. You are called to serve. And when we are called to serve, it means that Christ will not send us unprepared and unequipped. It means that when Jesus calls us, he will set us aside just like he did those 12 disciples. It means that if he calls us, he will give us his authority to minister on his behalf in his holy name. The God of the universe will give you his authority to step out in faith and minister to people in his name. And then, and only then, just like the disciples did some 2,000 years ago, will he send us out. And when we step out in faith, just like those men did 2,000 years ago, we can rest assured that whatever God has called us to do, whatever he's challenged us to do in his name, whatever he's asked us to do, he's going to give us the power to do. I think we overcomplicate it sometimes. We fall into routine or tradition, not that those things are necessarily a bad thing on their own, but I think we seek those things out because we find comfort in them, right? We find, we find something calming about doing the same thing over and over. There's something about finding a tradition and knowing that it, it, it serves a purpose that I think gives us peace of mind knowing that we're part of something bigger. But I don't know about you guys, I found a lot of times when Jesus calls you, when he sets you apart and he begins to give you his authority and say, go out and do it, he's doing that in a way that is very seldom a calming, cathartic experience. It's usually terrifying. Just like those 12, we're charged to step out of our comfort zone and do things that the world, or maybe even our own minds, are telling us is impossible. If you say, go and share the gospel, that alone can be intimidating to most people. The idea that you have to talk about what you believe it means you have to know what you believe. But don't, don't just talk about it. To live the gospel and live the gospel in a way that is transformative, that changes lives. I think, I think even that, though, we can kind of wrestle with and grasp. But if God set you apart and said, I'm giving you my authority and I'm sending you out, I want you to speak to people. We could say, okay. What if he said, I want you to heal people? 
And thankfully, we, we have very qualified people, doctors, nurses, that, that are doing that very thing. But what if, it was, what if it was more extraordinary than that? What if God really challenged our boundaries and our understanding of what is possible? And he says, I get that. They have their service. What I'm telling you is, I know you're a carpenter. I know you're a construction worker. I know you're a school teacher. I want you to go out and heal people using nothing more than my name. I want you to seek out those that the world says are untouchable, unlovable, unacceptable. And in the mighty name of Jesus, I want you to love those people, touch those people, accept those people and bring them in, even if, even if the world, even if our our own sensibilities, even, even if our, our customs or traditions say that's not usually the way that we do things. What if the God of all creation set you apart and gave you authority and sent you out and said, I want you to raise the dead? Would you entertain such an impossible thought? And if you did, what would that look like? I have every faith that each person in this room is being called by our creator. That he he or she is being set apart for a special work unique to them. And I'm sure that that's very intimidating and somewhat frightening. And I just want to reassure you that it's not your inner monologue that's calling you and setting you apart. It is the voice that spoke stars into existence. It's the voice that said, let there be light, and there was light. It's the voice that from the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's the voice that said, if I go to prepare a place for you, you can count on the fact that I will return and bring you home to live with me for eternity. That voice is calling each and every person in here and setting you apart for something, which means that if he's doing that, he is giving you his authority. The king of all heaven and earth, the God whose creation bows at his feet and even the wind and the sea obeys him is giving you his authority to step out in faith and serve however he has called you to serve. Which means if you've been set apart and you've been given that authority, the next step is God is going to send you out. Common sense will tell you it can't be done. The devil will do everything he can to convince you it is a fool's errand. It's an impossible task. At best, it really happened 2,000 years ago. At worst, just a story designed to get our affection and attention pointed in a particular direction. But I promise you this, his word is true. And if he is asking you to do something, He is giving you the power to do it. If you want to respond to that call, if you want to acknowledge that you have been set apart, if you want to acknowledge that you have been given the authority of the Creator God, the heavenly authority of the name of Jesus, if you want to be sent out to speak with people, to heal people to raise people who are dead in this life up to life in Christ, then I challenge you in this moment, stand with me now. Will you respond to his call? Amen. Join me as we pray. Father God, we thank you for such a simple truth, an acknowledgement that if you ask us to do something, you will give us the power to do it. You've seen your children here this morning. They're here because they have experienced your love. They're here because they have heard you calling them out of this world, setting them apart for something. They might not even know what, but something. 
and they're acknowledging it, you've seen them stand and say, Lord, here I am, go send me. And what we ask this morning is simple, Father. We just ask that, that confirmation that you've set us apart, that assurance that we're hearing you is there, so that we can, with confidence, accept the authority that you have given us when you have given us this call, and that we respond faithfully, and as we go out from this place today, in our lives, during the week, wherever the future may lead us, that we do so in a way that lifts up the name of Jesus. So that when that time comes, and I pray, Lord, it comes soon, that every eye will see him, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess. All of us will gather together with those whose lives we've intersected with along the call, and we rise with you to live with you for eternity. I pray that day comes soon, and I pray that as we leave this praise, Father, that we lift up the name of Jesus. I ask all this in his holy name, in the name of Jesus. Amen.